If that is the case, then you must ask the question, why, why will you allow so many cars on the road? After all, you don't know who is going to drive with. You don't know who has a license. You don't know who is going to have an accident. That is why you have people on the road to regulate those kind of things. But I'm saying already, I've not, I'm not, I'm not suggested by any stretch of the imagination that we should regulate. There are already regulatory institutions. There, is already, there are already institutions that are capable of dealing with almost everything perceived anticipated by this bill. Bishop Kuka, you know, uh, one of the major themes as I've listened to you this morning is this notion of, okay, there's a link between structural deficiencies and uh, the, the role of CSOs in our society. Uh, but I, I, I really want to look at the fact that when you look at the structural deficiencies you talked about, which gave rise to Boko Haram and some of the other problems that we have in terms of infrastructure, you're looking at corruption. Uh, and we know that there has been a, a precedent set over time in Nigeria where you have not just public officials but wives of public officials who use NGOs and, and various uh, altruistic appearing schemes to uh, siphon public funds. And, and, and corruption comes in here because we talked about IPOB and national security but when we talk about fighting corruption we need to know what, what NGOs are doing the work they're supposed to do and those that are being used as masks or facades to steal public funds. What are your thoughts about that and, and what role can a potential regulation of NGOs play in the anti-corruption war? Look, you know, this kind of paranoia, as I said, is a hangover of the military. Um, the whole idea or the whole notion of first ladies and second ladies and third ladies is foreign to democracy. However, in a more serious country, because had there, there was, you know, 29 years of military rule, all right, we had an accidental transition. We didn't have a transition to democracy. And in any case, theoretically, transitions to democracy to, from dictatorship don't necessarily lead to transitions to democracy. The South Africans had a transition. Mandela came out of prison 11 February 1990. He didn't get sworn in as president until, I think, May 14 or May 18, 1994. If you go back and look at the South African constitution, they had a lot of time to have the most robust debate and conversation about the quality, the nature of the constitution that they're going to have. So when they elected members to parliament, they, didn't, they simply went there to append their signatures to an existing draft. Hmm. Compare Michael, that with the Nigeria. You, compare, no, you're, I'm, you're not sure. I'm going to ask you to please hold your thoughts. I will let you finish up when we come back from this you. break. Please stay with us. Well, Bishop Matthew Koka is still with us in the studio. He is the Bishop of Sokoto Diocese. Just before we went on break, you were answering the question that Ajiri posed on structural deficiencies. Yes, I mean, I use the word structural deficiencies because, look, 29 years of military rule, characterized by coups, counter-coups, killings, and so on and so forth, severely divided the Nigerian nation. We have an accidental transition because the only reason we had a transition was Abacha suddenly died. Um, but as, you, as the evidence is now clear, the military had made up his mind that Obasanjo will be president, even before the formation of the P, what finally became the PDP. So we had a semblance of whatever. But that suggests very clearly, and to even to the fact, to the point that now we still have a retired general as our president, it's not about how good they are or how cap their capacity to administer. It is that we are pretending to be in a democracy because we're really not yet in a democracy. And you can see from the reflexes and part of this, tragically for me, is what is encroaching into the National Assembly that is behind this whole bill. That people are nervous about freedom. And for me, if you look at South Africa, imagine why didn't uh, white people contest for seats in the parliament? Why didn't the clerk contest against Mandela? If you have a transition that clinically seeks to separate the past in order to create a new future, then perhaps you would have thought, imagine what Nigeria would be like if you had, let's say, Ganifa Wehimi as a, a senatorial general of Nigeria. Because he had paid the, you know, he had paid the, literally paid the price. Or if you had, when I had the rumors were on that Femi Falana was the attorney general of, of, of Nigeria, I called him, you know, out of excitement. So what I'm saying is that we are nowhere near a real transition yet. And this is why this bill is dangerous. Because... If he doesn't address all those things, and we haven't come to a point where we can detoxify the system, to, to answer your question, what are the things that are creating the hemorrhage? 
whether it is an office of a first lady or whether it is a, a system, as you now we are, we are now hearing, the obsession with security votes has a historical reality. Because under the military, the military were obsessed with security because you didn't get to power by a ballot box. You just got to power depending on who was able to pull the gun first. And so the obsession with security was it personalized the state. So if you attempted to, to obstruct